Well, amen. Bless you, bro. We are, uh, we had a guest speaker last week, and just the way this has worked out, um, because of schedules, <clears throat> we're going to have another guest speaker this weekend. Next weekend, I'm back doing the seven trumpets. <laughs> Read through them, get all freaked out first, and then I'll come and explain it to you so I won't be so scared. <clears throat> well, today we have a, a, a guest with us, Kirk Bennett is a friend that I've known for about four years, and uh, he kind of came into our life when we were just, uh, Cindy and I were bewildered. We didn't know where God was leading us. We were in the desert, physically in the desert, and Kirk and I became friends. This is a man that prays, and I'm not saying this as a religious thing to boast, but he's a man who spends multiple hours a day with Jesus, five to six hours a day with the Lord in prayer and in the Word of God, and it just kind of oozes out of him. And he was huge in shaping kind of our thought processes as we were going through that valley and through that desert. He has a ministry called Seven Thunders. He's from Kansas City, Missouri, traveled all over the globe preaching and teaching. He has stories that would just blow your mind of what God has done. It's 1043. I'm just, I just want to, I just want to say it so that you don't have to look at your clock. We're going to be done at 11.30, so he's going to preach to you for 45, maybe 50 minutes, maybe 55, and you're going to love it. You're going to be blessed, blessed, blessed. Would you welcome my buddy, Kirk Bennett? Good morning. Good morning. He is absolutely right. I should finish before 11.30 tonight. Don't worry. <laughs> I was made for the Chinese church. Anybody ever been to the underground church in China? If you preach for less than four, five hours, they're really offended at you. For real. They, they, that's really the way it is. The hunger and the... The, the desire for the Word of God. In, in America, we've got so many things going on, we just need to chew one thing for a little while, I guess. So, uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. If, how many of you were here last night? Okay, it's just a few of you. All right. Well, good news is I'm teaching a different message than last night. So, if you heard last night's message was really good, you can get the recording of that one. I want to tell you about this one. Um, I have some teaching uh, and music back in the back. Um, I've been traveling for the last uh, 15 years all over the world, based in Kansas City. Um, my desire is to be a, a priest before the Lord, to be one who, who stands before him. I want to be known in heaven. How many of you want to be known in heaven? A lot of people get known on the earth, but they're never known in heaven. You know, I think about those, those demons who said, Paul we know and Jesus we know, but who are you, you know? And, and uh, I want to be known in heaven, I want to be known in hell, and whether I'm ever known on the earth is irrelevant to me. Um, I just believe that. This is a series called Overcomers. Rick's been teaching through the book of Revelation. This is Revelation 2 and 3. There were overcomers. How many of you want to be an overcomer? How many of you know you have to overcome something? <laughs> ah, <laughs> the overcomers are promised great rewards, heavenly rewards, and so many times we're, we're, we're caught in a society that just looks for earthly rewards. Do you know what I mean? We're all going, well, if God's got good, then give me an iPad, you know? Can I have an iPad, Lord? And, you know, I have an iPad, but... That it's, it's not about that. There's something greater than that. He promises to the overcomers things like the bright and morning star. Now, what in the world is that? I'm thinking that's better than an iPad. How about you? I mean, the overcomers are promised the greatest rewards, and all that you have to do is die without denying Jesus. That's how you be an overcomer. Whether you die 
literally in persecution and martyrdom, or you just live a long life and die without denying him and denying your faith. You're an overcomer, and the rewards are great in heaven. And we're called to be those overcomers. And so I want to encourage you to get a hold of this real simple teaching series. Now, these are in MP3 format. A lot of us older ones have no clue what MP3 is. That's okay. Your computer does. Just stick it in your computer, and, and your computer will figure it out for you. And if it doesn't, find a 12-year-old. They'll help you. Okay? <laughs> So I just want to give this away to someone. Who can I give this away to? This is a free teaching on the overcomers. Right there, that lady there. Will you come up here and meet me halfway? Yeah, you. Well, bless your heart. <laughs> you win something for a change. Man, when you stand in heaven, you will say, I had no idea what I won. <laughs> it's glorious. Okay, this was called Contending for the Glory. There was an outbreak of the Spirit of the Lord in America in the early 1900s. It actually began in a, a city called Topeka, Kansas, and then spreads to California, to Azusa Street. A power of God outbreak. I had the opportunity to speak in Topeka, Kansas, on one of the anniversaries of, of that outbreak. And um, I did this teaching series called Contending for the Glory. There are four times in the New Testament where the audible voice of God breaks in. Four different times. Each of those times is a revelation of the glory of God. There's also a teaching uh, that I do in here on tongues and, and the, the gift of tongues and how hidden it is and how powerful it is. And I want to encourage you, if you don't understand tongues, to get a hold of that. This is an MP3 as well. It's okay. It'll go on your iPhone. Okay. Contending for the glory. Who can I give this to? Right there, that lady in the orange. Yeah. There you go. Bless you. All right. This is called Deepening Revelation Through Meditation. This is a story of my prayerlessness. I got called to be a, a full-time minister and a pastor, and praise God, my senior leader, we had a prayer room in our church, and he said, I want all of our pastoral staff, which was 30 uh, pastors, he said, I want all of you in the prayer room eight hours a week. And I'm thinking, that is awesome. I am going to be so spiritual. This is amazing. I never prayed eight hours in a month. Eight hours in a week, this is great. My shadow is going to heal people, you know. I'm thinking, I'm going to be, then I get into the prayer room, and I'm going, ew, what do you do in here? The Lord's telling me, you're an intercessor, and I'm going, what did I do wrong, you know. I'm thinking, surely God is punishing me. So I had no idea what to do in the place of prayer. This is a story of how I walked into a completely different place in my life, and I'm never going back. It was fantastic what God did to change me. A simple method of how to encounter Jesus using your Bible. What a concept, huh? To actually encounter Jesus using your Bible. I have moms that are teaching their children how to do this. Little four-year-olds that are meditating on a Bible passage for 45 minutes every day. Now that's cute when you're four, but when you're 14 and you've done that for 10 years, now you're a force to be reckoned with in the earth. We have... Uh, pastors, adults, missionaries who are getting alive in the scriptures just using this simple method. I have it in book form, I have it in CD form, and I have it in DVD form. I want to encourage you to get it, and I want someone under the age of 25 to come up here and take this one out of my hand. If you want it, come get it. You got to be quick. There you go. Bless you, man. All right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> if you don't have a Bible, take the one from the person next to you. Open up to Matthew 3. <laughs> I do that with offerings too. If you don't have any money, reach into the pocket of the person next to you. Give like you've never given before. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Look at verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized, and John tried to prevent him. He said, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? And Jesus answered and said, permit it, 
to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed it. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him, and suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father, could we know the Son of God like this? Could we be sons like this, with your pleasure over our lives? Could we hear that voice in our own life? Could we know you in that way? Or we're asking for that this morning. The knowledge of God in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love the Bible. Do you love the Bible? we got to learn to love the Bible again. A lot of us, the Bible gets boring at times. I figured out something about the Bible. It's not boring. I am. I am. When I get bored with the Bible, it's me, not the Bible. Somehow there needs to be a way that we go deeper. There was a man, his name was A.W. Tozer. He used to stand in the pulpit at times and hold his Bible up. And he would say, I don't read this book. He would say this in churches and people go, oh. He said, no, no. This book reads me. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of my heart. This book finds me out. Beloved, I think it's time that instead of reading the book, we let the book read us. We let it invade us. I'm learning that this book is painfully wonderful if you let it invade you. I spend time in the Bible getting God to believe that I don't believe it. I read passages and I go, Lord, I don't believe this passage. I don't want to pretend that I believe something that I don't believe. I want to go deeper in it. So I stay in it over and over and over again. I want to believe it, but I know there are many things in here that I have not seen manifested in my own life. There are many things in here that I have not taken, as it were, a step through the door called belief instead of the mental ascent of belief. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's time that we live this thing. It's no longer enough to have a word. We need to become the word. The transformation that happens by the word. Well, Jesus comes to John to be baptized. Jesus is the word. He's the living word. And as he's baptized, three things happen. The heavens open. How many of you know if the heavens open at a baptism, it's going to be a good baptism? (laughs) Something took, you know. (laughs) The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. Now, it wasn't a bird. It was like a dove. It was the hand of God that came onto Jesus. I think he felt something. I think he felt the very hand of God, the Father, on him. And then a voice comes out of heaven. Now, if you have a baptism and a voice comes out of heaven, you're having a really good baptism, okay? You might want to write that one down. That one's going to work for sure. A voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. These three things happen virtually simultaneously. It's a revelation of the Father in this passage. It's as men, men, how we bless our children. Have you ever blessed your children? I don't mean with a $20 bill to fill up the tank. Well, that wouldn't fill the tank. To give you an eighth of a gas tank. I mean, have you ever blessed your children? Have you ever opened the heavens, as it were, and moved towards your child? Have you ever put your hand on your son or your daughter and said, son, daughter, you are my son, you are my daughter, in whom I am well pleased? Have you ever done that? See, that's what the Father did for the Son. Now, how many miracles had Jesus done at this point? None. How many people had he raised from the dead? None. How many many times had he swiped a kid's tuna fish sandwich and fed 5,000 people? None. Who had he brought up off off the mat? None. 
So what was the father pleased about? He was pleased because he was his son. It was not about performance. It was about identity. Do you know who you are? Do you know the pleasure of God over your life just because of who you are? Do you understand who you are? Many of us in life, we're trying to figure out what to do. As we get older, you know, people are figuring out how to retire. I want to figure out how to refire. I want fire in me again. I'm a grandfather now. I can't believe that. I'm married to a grandmother. <laughs> How'd that happen? I don't remember marrying a grandmother. I'm married to a grandmother. But I have grandbabies. Any of you have grandbabies? Aren't grandbabies awesome? I love grandbabies. Every time my daughter or my daughter-in-law has a grandbaby, I want to be there right away. Give me the grandbaby. <laughs> I love them. I love to hold them. Have you ever looked in a newborn's eyes? It's always one question. What will this one be? You know? It's amazing. If I had known how easy grandchildren were, I would have had them first. <laughs> I would have skipped kids and gone to grandbabies, man. They're so easy. You just give them chocolate and send them home. <laughs> you know, if they smell, you just give them back. And when they give them back, they smell good again. It's awesome having grandbabies. I had the grandbabies over to our house. We have a, a family dinner on Tuesdays, and the, and the kids come over, and the grandbabies come over, and we have a meal together, and our house is just wild. I mean, it's loud, and everybody's shouting, and we're trying to figure out politics is on the table, religion's on the table, all the illegal things are on the table. We're going after everything at our house. And then when we're done the meal, and the kids don't eat half their meal, because they're saving it for the sugar grandpa is going to give them. <laughs> we go into the, the, the living room and we have a big pillow fight. I just love that. I love being with the little ones. I just love it. They can just sit there and do their stuff, you know, and they're breaking lamps and all that stuff, and I just laugh. I go, oh, well, <laughs> your parents are going to whoop you. <laughs> the other day, I was over with my three grandchildren, but my wife and I were babysitting, and, uh, and our, uh, my son and his wife were out on a date, and so we babysit, and I bring a big bag of jelly beans the jelly belly kind, extra thick in sugar. And as soon as I get there, as soon as they're done dinner, I just start handing each one of them jelly bean one at a time. They're just sitting there, <laughs> eating the jelly bean. I finish the last jelly bean, and my son and daughter-in-law walk in, and I go, well, got to go. See ya. <laughs> I love grandbabies, not for what they do, for who they are. It's just beautiful to watch people for who they are. I got to sit in the back this morning during the worship time. I just sat back there because I just love watching the flock of God come in. And there's just such a joy and a, and a, and a, a gladness going on. The people, I'm glad to go up to the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be with the people. What's going to happen this morning? You know? I love that anticipation of just the gathering and being together. Well, Jesus needed that voice, this is my son, before he did any of the miracles. Do you know he needed it? We have this thought that Jesus didn't need anything. Yes, he did. He needed food for his body. He needed things. And he needed this voice out of heaven. The Father knew it. The Father had ordained this time. Because immediately Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted. Do you remember that part? What was he tempted with? It wasn't bread. 
It wasn't power. It wasn't throw yourself down. It was this. If you are the son of God. That's how the enemy comes at him. He's just heard it. Jesus goes, I know I'm the son of God. He just told me. I'm not going to do anything you say. I know who I am. Beloved, we can live in our identity. We are sons of the living God. Most of us are looking for our function because we don't know who we are. In 1990, I had been saved for, for about 17 years. I had this hunger. I was on a five-year quest. I didn't know it was going to take that long. A five-year quest because I kept hearing about the Father, and I wanted to know the Father. I knew Jesus was my Savior, but I didn't know the Father. And there was this sort of orphan spirit in me, as it were, a lack of understanding of the Father and the, the directness that I could have with him, not just with Jesus. And I went on a journey because I wanted to know the Father. And I realized that my own Father was a misrepresentation of the Father in heaven. How many of us go, well, duh. <laughs> you know, of course he is. Even the best of fathers is a misrepresentation of the Father in heaven. And Jesus invites us into a process of coming to the heavenly Father Letting aside, he calls it, how much more will your heavenly Father give to you? The Spirit of the Lord on the inside. The Spirit of the Lord coming from the Father is the Spirit of the Father. It's the Spirit of sonship, as it were. It's the Spirit of adoption. How many of you go, I need the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I do. Oh, man. I need the Holy Spirit. I get up every day and go, God, please, I need you. I'm desperate for more of you. I'm never satisfied with a little God. Are you satisfied with a, just a little bit of God? How much are you satisfied with? That's how much you'll have. Whatever you're satisfied with in God, that's how much you will have. And when I found out there was so much more, I went, I want it. I want it. If there's more, I want it. And began a pursuit of the Father. Well, to make a long story short, too late, in 1991, January, I'm at a meeting. Man's teaching on the Father heart of God. I went to this conference because I wanted this specific understanding alive on the inside. And I go to the meeting, and he stands up and does kind of an altar call the first night. Anyone wants the spirit of the Father on their life? I stand up right away. I put my hands up. He prays nothing. I got nothing. I go the next night saying, okay, maybe it was an off night. Next night, I stand there, nothing. I'm going, oh. Third night, I come in. Prayer Nothing again. The man is up in the front and he's packing up his books and he's about to walk away. I said, excuse me, could I just talk to you for a second? He said, sure. I said, I feel like a little kid on the inside. Like I'm on a little tricycle and I'm riding up and down the street and I can't find home. I said, would you just pray for me? He put his hand right here on me and he said, Father, release him from the spirit of the fear of rejection and the spirit of the fear of abandonment. And two spirits, I had no idea they were there, lifted off of me. It was like, whew. I went, whoa. I, I realized now I should have looked down because it felt like I was about six inches off the floor just hovering. Like this weight had lifted off. And in that moment of my life, I began to encounter the Father. He came to me the next day during the altar call. I was at the altar, and, and this weight, this heaviness of God came on me. And I was just down on my knees. And I'm there. And suddenly, it was, as it were, the face of the Father before me. I can't describe how he looked, but he was right here. You know, he said to me, I like you. 
Oh, it ran through me like electricity. I did what anyone would do. I said, say that again. <laughs> he said, I like you. Oh, it happened again. This joy, this pleasure. See, I know God loves me. He has to love me. He's God. That's what God's do. I just didn't know he liked me. I was like, are you sure about this? Do you know what I've done? He said, do you know what I've done? <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> what he's done cancels out what I've done. He goes, exactly. I like you. I want to be with you. The God who knows us and wants to be with us. As I mentioned about my prayer journey and the little advertisement, the reason, main reason I didn't pray was I didn't have a right view of God's emotions over me. I didn't know he liked me. See, if we think God doesn't like us, we're not going to pray. We're going to go work for him to get him to like us. But we have no idea how much work we have to do to get him to like us. So we're constantly in work mode and we move from being sons to being slaves, workers for God. Bless God for workers for God. But there's a nearer place to God offered to all of us called sonship. It's who you are forever. Do you know Jesus isn't the only son? He's the only firstborn son. The only begotten of the Father. But since then, God's got an adoption agency that goes beyond anything we could invent. He's adopting us left and right. Isn't that glorious? That's you. You were the joy set before Jesus to endure the cross. You are the pleasure in the Father's heart. You are the one he's looking down on saying, I can't wait to be face to face with him, with her forever. Do you know what heaven's about? It's forever, isn't it? I mean, we, want a th we got a thousand reasons we want to go to heaven, right? How many of you want to go to heaven? You want to go to, how many of you would like to go right now if you could? You know, <laughs> I don't mean suicide, but I mean really. You want to go to heaven? <laughs> suicide people come up front. I'll pray for you. But, uh, but we got a thousand reasons, right? We want to swim in the river of life, eat from the tree of life, see if our grandmother made it, meet Abraham Lincoln, you know. We got a thousand reasons we want to go to heaven. God only has one thing he wants in heaven. You. There's only one thing he wants. You. He had his son killed over this. See, if we come into this, if we receive this, not just say a little prayer, Jesus, I do, but we receive the affection, the desire of God, we can go from being workers and beggars in the kingdom to being sons in the kingdom. This is our calling. You are a son. Just look at someone and say that. I'm a son. Now, ladies, it's going to feel a little weird, but it's okay. Because where I'm going next is going to mess the men up. Turn to the last book of Revelation. Last chapter. You guys are in a study of Revelation. What kind of church are you? You crazy? <laughs> Our generation, man, we thought Jesus was coming back in the 70s. That book came out. We were all reading the book of Revelation, Daniel 9. Book comes out, 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988. Didn't happen. The revised edition, 89 reasons why Jesus will return in 89 came out. And most of us at that point kind of tore out the book of Revelation from our Bible and picked one verse, no one knows the day or the hour, and that became our end time understandings. There's a new generation upon us. And I could say simply put, the wisdom of studying the end times is we're closer than we've ever been. <laughs> and we are now. <laughs> and we are now. <laughs> 
And we are now, too. <laughs> Every moment is closer than it's ever been, right? It's wisdom. It's Jesus' last words. Some of his last words in his Passion Week was to do an end times conference teaching Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. The signs of the times. Why is he using that as his last words to prepare a church to be always prepared for what? A wedding. A wedding. The end times is about a wedding. Do you know that? See, we've been shortchanged. We've been taught, oh, it's disasters. It is that. It, 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 you know, it's wars. It's rumors of wars. It is that. That's not the end. The end, beloved, is a wedding. And the process of the human heart to the end is a bride making herself ready. That's what happens. She goes from being a bride to being the lamb's wife, in Revelation 19, who has made herself ready. That's what apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for. To equip the saints to a maturing. Those aren't the end. They're merely functions to make her ready for her wedding. That's what each of us are given. That's why the Lord instructs us on the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. It's the gracings of preparation to make your heart ready. And here's what happens. At the very last uh, verses, I'm trying to find it. Verse 17, Revelation 22. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. That water that Jesus offered to a woman who had had five husbands. After he tells her that, he's offering her the water of life. Do you know who you are? You're a son. But you're also a bride. The very last day's church, this verse sh shows, will come into an identity and into complete agreement with the Spirit of the Lord. And that's why Jesus returns. It's a people praying for him to come. They say, we can't do this anymore on our own. We must have you come. A people who become so desperately dissatisfied, grateful for what they're given in life, but dissatisfied without the fullness of Christ himself. That's why he comes back. That's what he is building in us, yearning for him. One of my favorite little passages is in John 12. It's right at the end of Jesus' ministries. It says the, the, the Greeks come and they, they come to Philip and they say this, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. We want to see him. Oh, is that not the cry in our hearts? Is that not really what life is about? I just want to see him. I want to know him. I want to, if there were a button I could push and see him face to face, that thing would have been worn out by now. I just, I long. I mean, you all are nice and all, but I long to see that man, to see him face to face. That's my yearning, my heart. That's what I'm made for. That's what you're made for. It's to see him. We get told in the church because so few people have so few experiences and pursuits of God, you can't see him anymore. You just you just got to live by faith. I want to tell you, faith has eyes. Faith sees. 
Faith sees what the natural man does not see. And I want to tell you, there's a living man with eyes of fire right now looking down on us. And he's going, Father, is it time yet? I want my bride. And he's saying, hold on, son. He's just holding him back. Come on, son, just a moment. She'll yearn for you in just a moment. That my spirit is working in her this work. She will yearn for you in just a moment. And when she does, she will cry in agreement with my spirit. And then I will send you. And you will know that day and that hour that it's time. Oh, there's something bigger going on, isn't there? And our goal in missions is just to get as many people looking at that man before he comes as we can. And beloved, we are in the end times in this sense that the gospel will go around the world and the end will come is a prophecy from Jesus himself. And we are for the first time in human history, inside of five years, missiologists are saying right now, where the gospel will be fully in every nation within the next five years. Five years ago, they said we're 30 years out. Five years later, they said we're about five years out. And then the end will come. Beloved, we're in one of the most amazing times of human history. I'm so glad I was born now. I really am. And I, I'm just in prayer. God, don't let me die. I'm grabbing on to Simeon's prayer. Don't let me die until I see this thing happen. This glory, this son of yours, get his inheritance, the nations. That's where we live right now. That's what it's about. That's what it's about in your workplace with the per person next to you that you work with that you're burdened about. I'll use just this last little time to touch on the next identity. You're a son. You're a bride. Look at someone near you and say, I'm a bride. <laughs> Guys, how awkward was that? <laughs> I get to travel and teach. I was teaching one time in, in Texas at a house of prayer there. And they, and they just got lit with the message of the Song of Songs. And the director's son was a wrestler for the University of Oklahoma, one of the top wrestling uh, teams in the country. This was a few years ago, about five years ago maybe six, seven. He was a wrestler for the University of Oklahoma, and he got lit with the Song of Songs message. And he went back to the University of Oklahoma and started a Bible study on the Song of Songs with the Oklahoma wrestling team. <laughs> they had this one guy, this six-foot-eight African-American wrestler. He was one of the best in the country, this huge guy. He said it was amazing to watch that man go, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Everybody. <laughs> there is a part in us. Our spirit is made for a deep love. It's not sexual. It's not carnal. But it's very deep. It's beyond even what we could experience with our spouse. It's intimacy with God himself at the deepest of heart levels. We're made for this. It's how we walk out our bridal identity. Pouring our deepest in affection into God. It's called the first commandment. Jesus said all the law and the prophets hangs on to love and love. Love God and love people. It's the final exam. When you get to heaven, the final exam is not how many people did you lead to me? The final exam is, did you love me? And you can't cheat on that one. Knowing the answer here doesn't count. It's knowing the answer here. Did your feet run to the place of affection with God? Are you pouring out your affections? 
Many of us say, well, I don't have that much affection. Well, God does. Start by receiving his. That's how we become true lovers. We hear these words. Do you ever just live in it? Do you ever stop and go, oh, you love me. <laughs> you love me, God. Thank you. I receive your love. Do you shut the voices of condemnation off and just receive the love of God? Oh, beloved, you do that, and your heart transforms. It begins to overflow. It's called the second commandment. You're able to love others because you have received a depth of love for God and reciprocated it with him. That's how the second commandment becomes truly active in your life. For the bride of Christ, betrothed to him, being made ready for the wedding. Now, just one more verse. Exodus chapter 19. And I'll tell a story and we're done. How many of you are bored here today? Just checking. Would you tell me if you were? <laughs> Exodus 19, 5 and 6. How many of you are here today? Okay, a few of you. All right. Exodus 19 is an amazing chapter. I'd encourage you to spend time in it. It's where Moses is taken up on the mountain. He has an 80-day visitation with God. How many of you know that's a good quiet time? <laughs> 80 days face-to-face -face with God. Many of us write off Moses. Hey, 80 days face-to-face -face with God. I don't know many people who have had that happen. No food, no water. Wow. I met one woman. She had 90 days in a fast, no food, no water. She died. And on the third day of her funeral, she raised up from the dead. How many of you would have liked to heard those stories? <laughs> they were amazing. True story, a lady in India. <clears throat> Exodus 19. It's the first gathering time for the people of God. Up until this time, God's been encountering individuals, the fathers. But this is the first gathering time, the first time when all the people of God are brought before the mountain. They have church for the very first time in the scripture, Exodus 19. There's thunderings, lightnings, and voices on the mountain. They're all going, we're not going up there. Moses, you go up there. That thing's scary. Moses goes up, beginning in verse 4, God says to Moses, you have seen how I brought you out of Egypt. He's talking ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, the all birthed out of a Passover, a revelation of Christ before thousands of years before he came. And this manifestation of glory and power, just like happens when the revelation of Christ breaks out in the book of Acts with signs and wonders. And just like will happen preceding the revelation or the fullness of Christ coming in and the signs and wonders that will break out. Three generations have a very similar heritage in the scripture. The time of Moses, the time of Jesus in the book of Acts, and the last days. We're going to see it with our eyes, beloved. Exodus 19, verse 4. You've seen, I brought you out of Egypt. I bore you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself, not to church. I brought you to myself. Have you ever come here to come to God? Just to challenge you to do this. On Friday night, stop. Take a time. Set yourself before the Lord and say, God, I want to get my heart ready to come in and meet with you on Sunday. Just begin to let your heart get worked rather than letting down from the work week and finding you got to get to Sunday, you got to repent. Begin the process a day or two early and just say, God, get my heart ready. Get my heart ready, Lord. I want to be in front of you full of joy. I want to be able to receive and give to you the honor and the glory that's due your name. He says this, now therefore, indeed, obey my what? Voice. Not commandments. Voice. You see, it's very personal with God. 
Obey my voice. Keep my covenant. Keep my covenant. You shall be to me a special treasure. I love that phrase. It's one Hebrew word, segulah. Everybody say that. Segulah. It's the highest prized possession of a king. In the scripture, it's used twice by kings, David and Solomon, to reference the, uh, the highest value of worth of treasure that they have. All the rest of the times in the Old Testament, that word is used to describe God's people by God himself. You're the segulah of God. You're his special treasure. Peter says it in 1 Peter 2.9. You are a special treasure. Holy people. The Sega law, the setting apart, is not you live stuffy holy lives. It's a place of being set apart into the joy of God himself. He says, you'll be to me a Sega law above all the people. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Not kings and priests, a kingdom of priests. What's that mean? You will have access directly to God himself. The priest is the mediator between heaven and earth. They have access to God and then they go out among the people telling about their stories of encounter with God. Priests do three things, basically. They come in, they worship. They go between the porch and the altar, and they pray, they intercede. And then they go out among the people, and they prophesy of the living God. It's the New Testament believer. We are worshipers of God, amen? Any of you don't worship God? Okay, come forward if you don't. I can help you. We pray, all believers worship, all believers pray, and all believers prophesy. They release the word of God, the testimony of Jesus, that spirit of prophecy. This is who you are. In the year 2000, 1999 actually, the Lord called me a priest. I said, I beg your pardon. I'm thinking Pharisee, Sadducee. I, I, that doesn't sound good to me. <laughs> he said, you're a priest. I said, I'm sorry. What did I do? How do I repent? He said, no, this is a good thing. He starts calling me like Zadok. I'm going, I don't get it. I don't know who that is. He takes me on a journey of, of, of this priesthood not calling identity. He says, tell my people who they are. They're priests forever. We're priests forever, beloved. Our, our job, and it's not boring, is to worship, to pray, and to prophesy. Whether you're working a job or you're full-time in the, in, in the house of the Lord, whatever it is, your, your, your duties are directly related to your identity. Most people don't know what they do because they don't know who they are. If you know you're a son, what do you do? You go hang out with dad and do what he's doing. If you know you're a bride, what do you do? You prepare and you spend time with your bridegroom. If you're a priest, what do you do? You come before him, 2 Chronicles 29, 11, and you stand, serve, minister, and burn in front of this God. Oh, you're awesome God. You're worthy of more than I could ever give. This is who you are. In 2012, or 11, excuse me, in February, I spent that month on a ministry trip in Africa, in South Africa. 
I was down there ministering, and uh, I had a team of 20 young adults. I take young adults with me where I go. I love just passing that torch into the next generation, empowering them to empower others. And, and I think it's time that we as an older generation wake up because this is the time to figure out what am I leaving behind if the Lord takes me up. And that place of what am I leaving behind? What do we pass into our children and our grandchildren? What, is, what, is, uh, what can pass on? And we're, we're, we're thinking in many ways, because a lot of us have parents who went through the Great Depression, we're thinking in many ways that, that this is all about getting enough stuff to be safe. How's that working out for you right now? <laughs> That's not what life is about. It's about an impartation that can pass no matter what the technology through to every generation. It's about a movement of the heart. So I go after young people. I hang out with young people all the time. It helps me from not feeling so old. <laughs> and I took 20 of them. We went to South Africa. We were on just a, an amazing journey in different cities in South Africa. And one morning, we have been teaching on justice, and the Lord said, I want you to do justice this morning. Divide your team into two teams. Send the first team into a, into a township in South Africa. Townships in South Africa are very dangerous, difficult places. And he said, send them there, so I knew they would be okay. And then he said, the rest of you, I want you to go with this girl. Her name's Diane, and go out on the streets with her and pray where she prays. Diane runs a ministry that is actually a national ministry in South Africa going after trafficking victims, sex slaves specifically, young women who are caught in slavery. Do you know there are more slaves right now in the world than in any time of all of human history? We have never abolished slavery in America. America is the, the largest importer nationally. We are the largest importer of sex slaves in the world. The largest right now. We're also the, the powerhouse for our abortions. And we are, we're the evangelist for the abortions globally. Beloved, our nation has changed. And it's time to take back the land. So she did that. She began that journey. She goes out on the street corners Friday nights in this Nigerian refugee area that has the worst crime in all of South Africa. And she goes out on the streets and stands. She's a, she's a, a, a white woman. She's 30 years old. She stands with the black prostitutes on the street corners. Hi, my name's Diane. What's yours? Kaylee? I want to be your friend. If you ever get in trouble, will you give me a call? And she hands him a business card. Says, could I just pray for you right now? And while no one's looking, they duck down and they pray. That's what Diane does. She's one of my heroes. So she said, I'll take you out on the streets and we can walk the streets as a team and I'll show you the spot. She said, it's not as dangerous in the daytime. I had two 16-year-old girls on this team. I was a little worried. Here we are, these plodding along white Americans walking through this intense area where racism is off the charts and, and hatred and intensity like that. One lady had heard, and she gave us a, she, she runs a security agency, so she got us a police escort. <laughs> so here we are prayer walking with a cop car following us. <laughs> I wasn't particularly afraid. I was a little more worried about what people would think of a cop car following us than anything else. I wanted to pray with people. But we're praying and walking along. One of the policemen in that car was a senior officer for the, for the police force in that area. He was a former Catholic priest. Now, I have no idea how that becomes your occupational route, but he was a former Catholic priest who became a police officer. We probably could use more of that in the police forces. He was a wonderful man. And we got about halfway through our walk. Diane stops us. She says, right up here, there's a brothel on the left-hand side. It's a house of prostitution. I know some of the girls that live there. She said, could we pray real hard as we go by that? The senior guy goes, wait, a brothel? He's kind of got this gleam in his eye. I don't know what's going on. 
He says, tell you what, stay right here, I'll be back. He walks up there, he goes, he calls back to us and says, when I come out on the sidewalk, you guys come on up. I'll call you up, just watch for me. We have no idea what's going on. This guy goes up, gets on the radio, calls in seven policemen, and they raid the brothel. Everybody into the backyard, bust in the front door. Everybody into the backyard, now, 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 now. Whoa. We didn't know what was going on. Then he comes out on the sidewalk. He goes, okay, come on up. <laughs> Ten of us walk up there going, what was that? We saw the policemen. We heard some commotion. We go up there. I meet a young man. His name's Simon. He's sitting on the front wall of this house. And we stop there for a moment or two before they're ready for us. And, and, uh, and uh, Simon's sitting there. And Simon says, hey, he says, you guys Christians? I'm a Christian. I went, okay, tell me what that means to you. He says, well, I'm from Nigeria. He said, when I was 17 years old, I was sitting in my bedroom. Jesus walked through the wall of my bedroom and stood in front of me and said, do you know who I am? He said, I said, I have no idea who you are. He said, I'm Jesus who died on the cross for your sins. He said, that's how I got saved. I went, okay, that counts. <laughs> Jesus, he said, walked right through the wall. Told me to go to church, so I went to church the next week. I was like, interesting. Then suddenly they go, okay, come on around the back. And so our team goes around the back, and here in the backyard is seven policemen, the pimp, and six prostitutes. The senior guy looks at me and goes, pray for them. Okay, I was just thinking prayer walk, Lord, you know. <clears throat> I walk up to the first girl. She was the most vocal of the bunch. I said, if you could have anything from God, what would you ask for? She looked me right in the eye. She said, a different lifestyle. She said, I want a husband. I want a family. And I knew right away I was not dealing with a little nine-year-old girl that had been skipping ropes saying, Jesus, make me a prostitute one day. I was dealing with a captive. In the back of that yard, there were several bedrooms with padlocked doors on the outside of the bedroom doors. I said, well, let's pray for you then. And we start to pray for her. And she just melts. Immediately when I said, let's pray, she turns her hands up like this, turns her face towards the sky and closes her eyes. I'm thinking, have you received prayer before? Because that's what a lot of people do when they get prayer. One of my worship leaders on the team goes over to a girl and says, what do you need prayer for? She said, oh, I got this abscess tooth. I've had it for a year and a half, and I'm supposed to go to the dentist. She wasn't going to any dentist. She said, it just hurts so bad. Would you pray for it? My worship leader put her hand right on that girl's cheek and said, in the name of Jesus, and the girl went, I'm well. She said, no, uh <laughs> in the name of, she said, no, I'm well. She said, really? She said, yeah, there's no pain. I've had pain for a year and a half. There's no pain. And suddenly, this joy, this excitement breaks out among the prostitutes. And this girl's going, I'm well. You guys, you need prayer. <laughs> and my team gets around. Each of the girls, the hardest girl, was sitting on the steps. And she was just sitting with her arms crossed watching the whole thing. And the youngest girl on my team, a just turned 16-year-old girl, sits down at her feet, looks her right in the eyes, picks up her feet and says, can I rub your feet? Just begins to rub this girl's feet and she just melts. She's looking at her going, who are you people? So we pray for them for a while, and suddenly the senior guy goes, okay, our time's limited. Girls, you need to sit down. He's going to preach you a sermon. He pointed to me. <laughs> I'm flipping through my sermons in my head, looking for one to preach to six prostitutes, a pimp, and seven cops. 
I can't find one. I'm going, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Suddenly I get a great idea. Before you have a sermon, you got to have worship. I turn to the worship leader. Lead us in a worship song first. <laughs> She's going through her songs. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> she turns to the girls. Do you girls know any songs? One girl goes, we know Amazing Grace. <laughs> we began singing Amazing Grace that afternoon in the backyard. Six prostitutes singing, seven police officers singing, ten of us singing. And the heavens were opened. And the harmonies off of these prostitutes were beautiful. And they were singing before the Lord. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It was amazing. I was weeping. We were all weeping. We didn't even know what to do next. The senior guy did. He goes, okay, girls, sit down. Now he's got to preach to you. I turn to these girls and I say, ladies, you are beautiful. God delights in you. He longs for you. You are the very daughters of God. This is not your destiny. You have a hope and you have a future. I have no condemnation in my being that I can bring to these girls at all. I just wanted to be on their team, in their church. The church of the poorest of the poor and the captives who can't get themselves free. I finished preaching what was maybe a three to five minute sermon and the girls in our team starts to all just hang out together and talk and, and they're praying with them and, and the senior guy takes me inside and I go through this house and there's, there's a mattress on every floor including the kitchen floor and there's no food in the house and there's no utensils and there's no furniture, just a mattress in each room and there's a, there's a bedroom with bars over the doors and a lock on the outside I go back and I find the guy Simon who was out front the Christian guy lives in one of the back rooms of the brothel with his wife who's pregnant with their baby Simon says, will you pray for me and my wife? I said, sure. And I prayed for them. He said, we're going to have a baby. I said, put your hand there. And I put my hand on top of his. And I began to prophesy. Here's a baby about to be born in a brothel. Simon had a little cross on the wall in his room. He had his Bible. I said, Simon, come out here. I stood, I couldn't get my mind off of the bars on that door. I said, Simon, what's that? He said, well, it's hard to explain. I said, no, 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 no. I said, Simon, you're a Nigerian man, right? He said, yeah. I said, Nigeria is a free country, right? He said, yeah. I said, then you get those bars down. You do not enslave women. He said, I didn't put them up there. I said, I didn't say you did get him down he said I don't know if I can do anything about that I said yes you can you are a believer in Jesus Christ you get those bars down and get your family and get out of here he said I have nowhere to go I said you have found nowhere you're nowhere already I said this is nowhere you need to find a different nowhere this is not the nowhere that God has for you. You get those bars down and you get out of here. You are a deliverer, young man. You are called to deliver your nation, a spirit of prophecy. And I'm prophesying to him as if he were my own son. We walk back outside. The chief of the police department is standing in the backyard. He walks up to me, stern look on his face. He says, I got one question. I was like, oh no. He said, when you're done praying here with all these girls, will you come and 
pray with us at the police station? Really? He said, I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood here. We're dealing with powers and principalities in our city. He said, this is small time crime here. He says, being funded by big time crime. Wealthy people. He said, it's got to be stopped. I make 800 arrests a month out of one police station. He said, this is out of control. He said, please come and pray with us. Here's what he said. The church won't do it. The church won't pray with us. The church won't step into these things. He said, we just need some intercessors to come once a week and just pray with us. He said, the church won't do it. And he said, we can't stop what's happening in our city without prayer. I went, we'll come. As we're about to leave, one of the prostitutes tells Diane, I want, to I want out. I want to leave right now. Will you guys take me with you? I grab two policemen. She gets her stuff. We walk her right out the front door, put her in a police car, drive around the corner. We put her into our car and we had her, had her in a safe house about 100 kilometers away by midnight that night. We walked a girl right out of human trafficking. No one got arrested. No one was mad. The heavens were open. We all sang Amazing Grace and had a good church service. What will God do with you as a priest, son, and bride? See, for the last three years, the Lord's been telling me one thing when I ask him what to do. He says, follow me. I go, yeah, that's all good. Follow me. You don't have to develop a plan. Follow me. Same thing I told Peter. Follow me. If you follow Jesus, and what I mean by that, you get before him daily as father, as your bridegroom coming, and as the living God, you stand before him and walk in your priestly calling. He will give you every instruction you need. You talk to him along the way, along the day. You take a pause and go, Father, I just want to say I love you. And you're awesome. You let him burden you with the lady in the Walmart store and your co-worker that everybody can't stand. You let him burden you with the affections of his heart. You walk as a true son in encounter with God all day. And he will give you the most amazing journey. I said to the Lord after that day, I said, Lord, if you had told me today we're going to go and we're going to go into a brothel with a bunch of police and raid the brothel and go out back and we're going to preach to them and pray for them, I'm not sure I would have gone. I definitely wouldn't have taken 16-year-old girls with me. The Lord said, that's why I don't tell you things. He said, I didn't call you to figure this out. I called you to follow me. If you'll follow me, there's no limit to what we can do. Beloved, that's our calling. Let's all stand. Now, some of you would probably agree you're not really walking in your identity. You're spending your time on your calling, but you're not really walking in who you actually are. You're not really standing as a priest. You're not really in that deep of a relationship with the Father. You don't really know Jesus as the bridegroom, the lover of your soul. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about in your own journey with Christ. If that's you and you're going, I need to know God so I can be who I am, not just do what I should do. If that's you, you're going, I want to step into this identity. I want to, I want to put, a, put a flag in the ground today and say, this is a marker day for me to shift things in my own life. To be before the Lord so that I can walk out my duties and functions, my assignments in life. But I want my identity to be first. And I want God's identity to be where I get mine from. 
If that's you, I want you to just come down and stand in the front. I want to pray a special prayer for you. So just come on down right now if you're going, I, I need to know Father. I, I need to know Bridegroom, really. I need to be a priest. Many of us were never told these things. But the reality is you're made for this. You're sons and daughters of a king. Come on down. Just push up to the front. I'm not going to be able to lay hands on everybody. Just come on and push up to the front. Let's be together, you guys. Let's be with God here, you know. He's here with us right now. It's time for a change. You know, we have our outer man who we spend most of our time on. But the scripture indicates there's an inner man, our spirit man on the inside. And if we let the spirit of the Lord lead us, he'll lead our inner man to the presence of God daily. Daily. Not just on Sundays, not just when the conference comes around. You get, you know, a, a wonderful jazz from the Lord for, for in the next three years. But daily, you're made to encounter him. To see his eyes. Many of you feel like you were disqualified somewhere. You're not disqualified. You don't understand who qualified you, that's all. Jesus qualifies us to be partakers of something. It's a divine calling. You're a spiritual being with a physical body. You're not a physical being with a spiritual body. Your spiritual being lives forever. You're just stuck in some flesh right now. It's time to let that spirit man live. That one on the inside. It's time to not deny him food. Not deny him the clothing, the robe of righteousness. Your priestly robe. And I just want to pray that right now. Close your eyes. Put your hands up and say, God, put upon me the robe of righteousness again. The robe of your son, the great high priest of the order of Melchizedek, the great king of righteousness. Put that robe upon me, Lord. The impartation, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. It's your robe that you wear. I'd encourage you, get up every day, put your feet on the floor, put your hands up. Let him robe you again and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the provision of righteousness that I could not do on my own. Thank you, God, for a robe on me, a priesthood robe. There's so much provision for your spirit, man. The scripture says to put on this robe of righteousness. Be intentional about that in your life. Wash me clean, God. Wash away the bad memories, the junk, and even this morning, the stuff in my life, the sins and the things that are a waste of my time. Wash me, God. I'm starting, I'm putting a flag in the ground and saying, from this day on, I'm on the journey with you. So many times we've come to the altar, but we've not seen much happen on the following Tuesday. I want to encourage you. This is about your spirit, man. Engaging God on a daily basis. You're a priest unto your God. Let him come upon you right now. See, when the prodigals came home, they were given a new robe. When the son comes in, the younger son, he's given a new robe, a new ring on his finger. It's the very name of the Lord to put God's name onto the works. The new sandals. He's going, I'm not even worthy, Father. The Father says, quick, get a robe on him before he gets religious. He tries to make up his own penance. Get a robe on him. You wear the robe of righteousness. You're a son. You're a daughter of a king. You live in royalty now. This is who you are. And you're betrothed to the Son of God. Your life is to be ordered to make yourself ready for His coming. Daily, 
It's not for some day in the future. Your preparedness is in this life now. You're in a 70 year, 80 if you do it well process. This is your end times. Walk in hopeful expectation of the Son of God. When the opportunities of compromise come, go, that's not who I am. When you see a brother or sister, you see a broken person going after sin, you just grab them and go, hey, that's not who you are. Come on with me. Let's walk a different pathway. I want to just pray right now. Father, I ask you, for your sons and daughters, you have made a way to enter the holy place. You have made a way for your people to come boldly before you. You've made a way. You said, I'm going to have a kingdom of priests, and God, here we are. Your priests before you. I ask for the oil of gladness. That oil of gladness to begin to pour over the heads of your people right now. Anoint them with gladness. Put your hand on their lives right now.